Previously on Balls. Sat next to me in the studio today is a man who, who I suppose I've known him for years on and off, but who I really came across during the World Cup when I met you and Lucas Redebe at uh, the, man, the brand new Moses Mabila Stadium. His name is Glyn Binkin, one of uh, South Africa's top, uh, what, what do we call you, an agent or a player representative? In England, if you say people are agents, they kind of slap you a few times, but I, I think agent, player representative. He, I've got a list of, uh, of Glyn Binkin's uh, players here the players club is his uh, organization and it's quite a staggering list starting with Bongani Kamalo and going all the way through to young amateur lads that Glyn Binkin looks after and of course Glyn uh, famously is uh, Lucas Redebe's man and we've just been talking about Lucas as well Glyn welcome to the show mate thanks Neil and uh, good morning to the listeners it's um it's going to be two hours and I'm going to kind, kind of use Glyn for as long as he can stay to kind of punctuate what we talk about today. Often we've got Comfort and we've got Darren Scott punctuating and sometimes even Maz. Um, but today I've got the, 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 the hugely valuable knowledge of, of, of Glyn Binkin sat next to me, which means that on just about any, uh, any topic, I've got a man who knows what he's talking about. It's, it's damn useful that when you're doing a show like this because we've got so much to talk about. Um, we've got to look... Most importantly, I guess, for South African football people this weekend at Kaiser Chiefs against Orlando Pirates. It's the slightly gimmicky um, Carling Black Label Cup where the fans get involved, and they get involved heavily. And when you think, you know, last week on Friday night, Glenn, we had uh, Orlando Pirates playing the Leopards, the, the Congo champions, a game that had everything to me uh, except goals. Uh, and it was a massive game. Been talking to Roger, been trying to... Uh, encourage people to buy the back to black shirt and go to the game not a very good crowd I, I, I haven't even seen an estimate of that crowd yet that's what also interests me about this country where you never see crowd figures and then you move to the Gauteng Cup and there's a massive crowd there at Loftus to see Kaiser Chiefs in a meaningless game against Celtic can you explain to me Glenn as a man who spent all your life in South Africa whereas I've only spent bits of it w why didn't why didn't Orlando Pirates fill the Orlando Stadium for, for, for a great game against Leopards I think you probably have to look at the, the quality of the opposition or, or the perception of the quality of the opposition. Obviously, with uh, Leopards being a top side in, in the DRC, um, it's they're not that well known in South Africa. So although Pirates is, is a crowd favourite within South Africa, second only to, to Kaiser Chiefs, um, the quality of the opposition, I think, ultimately dictates uh, the calibre of, of, of crowd you're going to get. I was uh, heavily involved in the Man City tour last year, mm. uh, last week, um, mm. And Man City had uh, an unbelievable squad. Uh, in fact, I think they've got the best squad in, in English football this in the season. world. Yeah, um, and they also failed to to draw crowds. Um, although SuperSport and, and Amazulu were fantastic in their marketing of the clubs and, and the marketing of the game, unfortunately, the, the fans didn't come to the stadium. Um, so I think one has to to look at that in a in a serious way. And it's good to see the the new PSL CEO Brent De Villiers, who whom I know very well, and oh I think will do a fantastic job yeah. uh, for the PSL. It's good to see him talking about um, one of his priorities being getting fans back into the stadium. That's brilliant. I, mean, I know you, were, you just said to me you were involved in the Manchester City link. Uh, I went to the Supersport game as a fan. I think there were probably about 12,000, would you say? Yeah, I think yeah. The, the official crowd, because I think there was a large amount of people in the hospitality, the official crowd was, yeah. was closer to 20,000. Um, oh. But okay. uh, for, a, for a game of that calibre where you've got uh, arguably the best side in, in English football or, or second best side in English football on current form uh, playing against um, one of the better sides in South African football, uh, it's probably a, a poor crowd by the standard. It was, and I loved it. I had a lovely afternoon. I mean, there were lots of, uh, for a change in Schwani, when, when I go to watch Sundowns and I go to watch Supersport uh, uh, in, in, in the Trichville or, or at Loftus, there's not that many... Um, White, white yeah, fans. Yeah. Okay, let's say it out loud. And, and what was great, there was a nice mix of people in, at Eastwood's, the old rugby kind of wine barish thing next door. Loads of uh, everyone just talking football. And that's really what South Africa needs. I think when you look at the success these the British clubs in particular get in the East, where they get full stadiums. Uh, when you looked, looked at that Spurs Sunderland game yesterday, Sunderland won 3 1 at Melbourne, and there's 90,000 Australians in the Melbourne cricket ground singing, uh, you know, you, you'll never walk alone. I just despair because I know South Africa can do that. I know that we have the football-loving population to, to carry that kind of occasion, and, and I'd love to see yeah, it. Yeah, I think someone like Brian de Villiers, who, who's had a, a history of, of working with uh, the Blue Bulls, amongst other sporting properties, yes. I think he'll know how to tap into that, that potentially white market who, who, at this stage, are not watching football. I think that it's very interesting that the Bulls have successfully tapped into the black market. Obviously, the Bulls being a traditional white Afrikaans mm. um, um, rugby team, 
uh, have managed very successfully to tap into uh, the, the black the black market of followers. Um, and I think the key is now to get the, I suppose, predominantly black sport of, of football in South Africa to be followed by, by white supporters. But I think ultimately it uh, depends on the quality of football on the field. And I think um, the PSL is doing an unbelievable job in terms of marketing the game, in terms of providing an infrastructure and facility. Uh, Supersport is doing an excellent job in terms of the broadcast of the, of the, the product. But it's up to the teams to, to, final, uh, to, to I suppose, up their game. <laughs> no pun intended, but up their mm. game um, on the field of play because ultimately that's what's going to sell um, the the product to the supporters is the quality of football on the field of play. Uh, which the PSL can't go out and, and do that for the players. Uh, the clubs themselves have to do that. But what's so funny, Glim, was y- you watch Arsenal go over and beat the Thailand national eleven, it's all star eleven seven nil, and then they won their next game seven nil. Here, Supersport gave City a great game, beat them 2-0. Then you get on to, to the Mosmobito. I wasn't lucky enough to go down because I love that place. And uh, and then Amazulu beat City 2-1. And you look at the players, you look at Vincent Company, you look at Yaya Toure, you look at Eden Deco, you look at Joe Hart in goal. And our, our teams have actually produced it in those two friendlies. Whereas th- these other sides are going, I know Man United have lost two of their three friendlies, haven't they? Uh, which is quite funny as far as I'm concerned. But it was quite nice to see the standard of football that we put out. The super sport side in particular, under Kevin Johnson, his first real competitive match, were absolutely, actually very, very good. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, not in defence of Man City, um, but the reality with Man City is that they'd only been training for a week mm. uh, by the time they had their first game. Um, they had their first training session on the 8th. Uh, they then flew to South Africa on, on the 10th, arrived on the 11th, and, and played their first game on the 13th. So obviously, uh, fatigue and, and a lack of, of match fitness was a, was an excuse for them, but, but on the day, Supersport put up an excellent showing. <coughs> the key and the challenge is for Supersport to put up an excellent showing across uh, 50 games in the season, uh, counting league and cup games, and, and the other teams as well but it was an excellent uh, advertisement for so for south african football and the game was broadcast in many countries across the world mm. so hopefully that helps to showcase our game that's what i mean that's what we're looking for uh, yeah i got involved with quite a lot of man city fans over those two weeks and it, it was good for, for football before we get a, our first kind of musical interlude glenn the, the most important person on your repertoire as far as i'm concerned as a, as a journalist at the moment is bongani kamala who, who, who i first kind of came across I came here on a cricket tour and watched Bongani play for Supersport when they, they were top of the league and sitting with a, a very small crowd actually at Supersport and, and watched this young lad, tall, leggy, uh, and he had it. And um, then we had the move to Spurs, happened about a year later, I think it was. because I'm a fan, you know this. <laughs> uh, Neil, just to clarify something, obviously all my, all my clients are as important to me. Mm. Each one is as important as the next. Obviously, Bangani is perhaps more profile than, than many of the others, but uh, I treat my clients equally and, and equally important. Um, on the Bangani kamala situation, um, he's been at Spurs for, for two and a half years now. Um, and during that period, he, he went on, on loan to Reading in, in the first season or, or the he only joined in January of the first season so he went to Reading on an emergency uh, sorry to Preston North End on an emergency loan where he did particularly yes. well um, and then broke a bone in his foot after about 10 games so, so was ruled out for a couple of months um, in s- the first full season that he was at the club he went to Reading um, started off okay um, and then unfortunately the, the he played six five games on the trot and mm-hmm. the sixth game they were always going to to give two other players a chance. It was a cup match. Uh, the other two players played and, and never lost their place in the team. It was an unbelievable situation where, where two central defenders um, played 25 consecutive games uh, yeah. without being injured or suspended. And I think both of them were on three yellow cards at one stage, but just never got the fourth yellow card. Exactly. So Mugani was slightly unlucky in that sense, uh, in that situation. And uh, in the January of 2012, then went back to Spurs for a couple of months. Um, but the reality, at, at even while he was at Spurs, he was training and playing with some of the best players in the world. Mm. So when he played in the Spurs reserve side or, or youth side, he was playing with the likes of Sandro and Carlo Cudicini mm. and Carl Walker and Carl Norton. Players are all playing regularly now for their, for their respective clubs. Yeah, exactly. So he was playing and, and uh, performing at, at a high high level. Um, last season, he went to Pauk in Greece on loan, um, which was once again to, to get him, I suppose, used to European football because that's that's a challenge that he had at Spurs is that uh, the step between the South African Premier League and the English Premiership is just it 
a vast step and it was a bit of a learning experience for him and, and all these experiences he's had over the past couple of years have, have certainly augured well for him in his career. But he went to Park last season, played every game except one before the African Cup of Nations. He then came to the African Cup of Nations where he, he captained South Africa uh, and as as the business of football dictates. Uh, Park went out and signed <laughs> two central defenders, <laughs> both of whom were going to be their own players and permanent yeah. players for the club um, f for the season beyond. So obviously Bangani was on loan um, and when he came back from the African Cup of Nations, he had lost his place in the team, but Bangani's always been a fighter. Whenever the, the chips have been down, he's always um, upped his game and, and was patient enough and, and sensible enough to to f wait and be patient and uh, work hard and, and fight for his place in the team and towards the end of the season he was back again back in the team again and ended up playing 25 26 games in, in a league which uh, in the european league ranking is number number 12 in the rankings ahead of uh, denmark belgium sweden? switzerland sweden yeah, yeah. Uh, poland a uh, number of those leagues so it's a very highly ranked uh, league in europe and Bongani played, uh, as I say, 75-80% of the team's games. The team came second in the league and they won the, the Champions League qualifying playoffs. Um, and towards the end of the season, he was uh, in, in unbelievable form. He was regarded as one of the better players in, in the Greek league, certainly in the last month of the, the league. Uh, he then came back to South Africa, had his, his uh, off-season or brief off-season and went back to, to England where the opportunity for him to train with Ipswich arose. Um, he did particularly well at Ipswich. He initially was only going to be there for, for three days, uh, played in a game on the third day and did particularly well. They mm. asked him to stay on for another game on the weekend. And after the another good performance in the second game, he was then uh, then came to to sort of talks about between the two clubs about the possibility of Bongani going there. And unfortunately, um, uh, the initial offer that uh, Ipswich, who are a Championship club, the initial offer that they made to to Spurs was declined, and um, Spurs went back looking for more money, uh, which which Ipswich did come back with a with a revised offer. But then Spurs threw a bit of a span in the works by insisting a on a clause in the contract whereby they would be able to recall the player in in the January transfer window. So January 2014, if they wanted the player to come back, um, they insisted on putting a clause in there that if they wanted the player to, to come back, uh, he would have to come back. And obviously that didn't suit Ipswich. Why would they take a player and invest in a player uh, if in six months' time they, they exactly. may end up losing out on the player? And at it. the same time, they got the opportunity to sign a player, Christoph Berra, who had worked with the manager, Mick McCarthy, at Wolves. Um, he was free and out of contract. And they were able to, s to conclude a two-year contract with the player as opposed to having a, a player that at best they would have him for one season, but uh, also faced the possibility that after six months may end up having to go back to back to his club. Um, yeah. I mean, it's really disappointing, and, uh, and I, I, I just cannot understand why Spurs even consider taking him back in, in, in January, because for me and for the player, it's more important that he's playing week in, week out. Um, Absolutely. And unless the only the only consideration I would I would concede to Spurs in that respect is if they had intention of playing him if he came back in January, which I uh, firmly don't believe is the situation. It, so now, the situation, that, as I understand, I saw Spurs... Uh, out playing in Hong Kong, wasn't it? Yep. Yesterday? Yep. It was Liverpool, Sunderland in Australia. Spurs are in Hong Kong. Spurs, um, Sunderland and Man City. Yeah, so you've got Hong Spurs Kong. out in Hong Kong. You've got their development squad in Portugal. So what does Bongani Kamalo do now? Yeah, the problem is uh, the Hong Kong squad, uh, they, had, they were restricted to a number of 25 players. And by the time Bongani um, ended the Ipswich um, situation, it was too late for him to be included in the squad to Hong Kong. Uh, they then indicated that they would like him to travel with the development squad, um, which basically comprised of a, a number of the younger players and more, more talented players, and some of the first team squad who, who didn't make the 25. Uh, but unfortunately, his visa had expired. Uh, we obviously didn't anticipate this situation, so his visa had expired, and he's now training by himself at um, at, at the Spurs training ground. Uh, Jeez, I mean, that's so destroying. Again on the weekend. Yeah, it's obviously very, so very disappointing for Bongani. Uh, but Bongani's always been a fighter. He's had a, a very tough life. Um, to date and uh, yeah, I think all the challenges that he's encountered in his life to date uh, all go well for him and, he, and his future which has helped him to fight on the field. Yeah I know Glenn th there's a perception that Bongani Kamalo because he speaks you know very good English his father as I understand it was a professor of linguistics at UNISA his mum was a was a good uh, good level teacher in this country Th they're both they're both dead now yeah uh, sadly and and a lot of people perceive Bongani I remember mean, when he first went to Spurs, Harry Redknapp said, oh, look, he's a lad from Africa, a big family. And Bongani, of course, doesn't quite fit that stereotype that Harry Redknapp likes yeah. for his African players. But 
Bangani Kamala, despite the way he speaks and despite the, you know, the, 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 the kind of feeling that he's quite middle class, he's had a very difficult life, as, as you were saying to me earlier, and, and, and he has to be a fighter to have got where he got. He's not, he's not that privileged. He's not the kind of bloke that was born with a silver spoon and yeah, a footballer to speak. I think the privilege that Bangani has got is that his parents were both uh, educated, and yeah. education was extremely important for, for his parents. As, as you say, his father was a professor at Genisa. His late father was a professor at Genisa, and his late mother was a teacher in Mamalodi. Um, and education was, was critically important for them. Uh, in fact, when Bongani was about 15 or 16, he played in a, a youth tournament in Ireland known as the Milk Cup, and he was scouted there by both uh, Chelsea and Man United, yeah. uh, who both expressed an interest in him coming across at that stage to, to undergo trials with him. And, and his mom wouldn't allow that because for him, for her, it was important that he, he stayed in South Africa and finished his, his schooling, which he ultimately did, mm. um, and then went across. Unfortunately, both his parents are deceased, um, mm. both for natural causes, and uh, they've had a, a huge impact on Bangani's life, and, and that's why I think he's a, he's a fighter more so than anybody knows. Um, and that's why one of the reasons why it's so important for him as an individual to stay and play in Europe. He, he doesn't have a mother and father to be able to come back to in South Africa. He doesn't have brothers and sisters. Um, so there's no real family reason as such to, to bring him back to South Africa, uh, whereas many of the other players um, would probably have jumped at the opportunity to come back to South Africa and earn fantastic money in South Africa and play play for the biggest clubs in the country. But yeah. Mani has fought his whole life to be able to play in European football, and he's not going to just give it up now because um, it hasn't worked out at, s at Spurs. Um, you know, Bagani's always been a fighter and, and will remain that way, which I think is now um, will also help him on the field of play. Well, there's a weird contradiction here, Glint. During AFCON, I got this awful impression that, that Bongani Kamalo, you know, one of our best centre backs, you know, in the time that, that I've kind of closely monitored South African football. I mean, you, you were, you and I both watched the Lucas Radebe situation develop at Leeds, and great centre half that we needed. Bongali Kamalo, I thought got a got a rough deal from the public uh, and from Gordon Iggerson, uh during AFCON and after AFCON <coughs> when he suddenly disappeared from the Bafana squad. But then in in recent weeks, with Orlando Pirates having Sia Sanguini injured. And, and lacking a centre half going into the Champions League group stages, with Kaiser Chiefs at the same time, uh, you, you, you have Morgan Gould as one of your one of yeah. your players. He's coming back from injury. Uh, Tao Matoho, great centre back. But despite that, a lot of people saying, well, "What about Bangani Kamala? What about you know if he doesn't make it at Ipswich, why play for Ipswich when he could come here and earn good money?" You've just explained why not. But I want you to. I, I feel very strongly that Bangani Kamala could come here and, and establish himself as as a great player. Uh, in South African terms, but you're saying to us he doesn't need to. He's going to try and fight to establish himself on the Lucas Rodebe level. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, I, I give credit to Bangani for that because from her perspective, it would be great to see him back in South Africa. He'll earn fantastic money. He'll play for the biggest clubs in the country uh, and, and hopefully get the, the sort of recognition and respect that he deserves. Um, he was at Supersport for, I think, four years. He captained the club for a number mm. of those years and when they won the... Af when the they only won, won the, the league every year, yeah. In South Africa. Um, so he's achieved a lot in South Africa. Obviously, he hasn't played for, for one of the big two or big three clubs in South Africa, which is something that he, he may end up doing in the future. But at this stage, his future is very clearly in European football. Uh, he's prepared to fight to, to stay there. And in many respects, uh, I see a lot of similarities with, with between uh, Bongani and Lucas. I mean, Lucas yeah. only went to Leeds when he was age 25. Um, shortly after joining Leeds, he, he broke, he, he tore his cruciate ligaments and was out for, for a long period of time. Um, it was very easy for him to then come back to South Africa and, and be with family and friends and, and uh, in, a, in a comfortable surrounding as yes. opposed to being in the cold winters of, of, English, of England. And, uh, and he didn't. He, he chose to sacrifice and to stay in Europe and, and uh, forge a career for himself in Europe. Um, unfortunately for, for Lucas, he was given the opportunity by George Graham, who gave him an opportunity, saw the player, believed in the player, gave him the opportunity to play, and uh, the rest is history. And he's now a legend in, in uh, Leeds and, and in English football. And Kaiser Chiefs, the pop group, of course. All yeah, down Kaiser to Lucas. Chiefs was named after Absolutely. Lucas. Absolutely. Um, and, and Bogani as well. He He's not going to give up on his hopes and dreams of playing in European football. Um, when he played in, in, in Greece, he, I don't think he got the recognition that he deserved. Um, and if we look back at the African Cup of Nations, um, I, I don't believe he had a bad tournament first of all he never asked to be the captain he was chosen as the captain yep. you know for him it was a huge honor to represent his country but it was an even bigger honor to be named as the captain mm. and that was a, uh, a he's been a captain before at Supersport. and to be fair to the team if i look around 
within that team there were a number of leaders but um, he was chosen as the leader for the African Cup of Nations and unfortunately I think he became a bit of a scapegoat for the for the team's lack of success in the Nations Cup I don't think he had a bad tournament um, I, I think that in the context of the team I think there was a lot of dynamics which didn't maybe work in his favour um, uh, I mean uh, I have the ultimate respect for Siobhan Sengweni who's a fantastic player but at the end of the day he, he's a, a right he was the right sided central defender who scored two goals from left wing in open play so clearly his tactical discipline didn't suit the team um, you know it was fantastic that he scored the goals and it was, mm. it was great he did get but he put goals, pressure yeah. on, the, on the defence and, and mm. the whole defence was, was criticised for their performances during the African Cup of Nations and, and Bongani in particular being the captain uh, as well as a central defender was was I think severely criticised and harshly and, uh, and unfairly criticised um, in in that respect. But uh, you know, as, as as important as it is for Bongani still to play for for Bafana, and he's he's never turned his back on his country and will never do so in the future. At this stage, it's about him cementing a career for himself at club football, which is his bread and butter, and week in week out. And uh, once he's able to do that, I'm, I'm sure he'll become a a Bafana Bafana player again. Brilliant. Uh, mate, I, I hope that he makes it. I hope he fights through it. This is Bulls Visual Radio.